Good evening, everyone. Um, uh, you're all very welcome. I'm uh, Kelly Fitzgerald. I'm the head of the School of Irish Celtic Studies and Folklore here in UCD. Um, and it's a really great honor to see the Aspen Bergen Lecture uh, back live again this year. And I'd like to introduce my fantastic colleague, Dr. Fung Jae Kui, to start the proceedings for this evening. Yeah, Fung Jae Roof, Glare, good seeing Leicht Bergen and Nacht. As Mission Dr. Fung Jae Chu, Leicht or Lua Guerrero, Shiver Tolna Gueltach. And uh, showing gosh our skull but uh, clear. Thank you for all for coming to the Osper uh, Osborne Bergen Memorial Lecture tonight. Um, it has been five years since the uh, our last lecture. Actually, the last uh, speaker was here is here and um, was held here in UCD. And I'm very glad that we can continue this wonderful tradition um, after the difficult years of COVID. And uh, this event is organized by the School of Irish Celtic Studies and Folklore, but it's also kind of supported by uh, Professor George Husley of Oxfordshire. Uh, before we start the lecture, I would like to remind you that as a convention, there will be no question and answer time after the lecture, but we'll host a reception afterwards in the Sean and um, upstairs, uh, where you're welcome to besiege our speaker with questions. <laughs> so um, our distinguished speaker tonight is Professor uh, David Stifter, MRA from Maynooth University. Most of you here already know David, uh, not because of his numerous publications that span from continental Celtic languages to medieval law and poetry, then at least because of his innovative textbook on Old Irish, the Sean Coy Dalek. Uh, David was also the uh, principal investigator of the ERC Horizon project from Logicum Hibernicum, which tried to measure the evolution of Old Irish using corpus and statistic methods. I was honored to be part of the project. His more recent projects include the Ogum, uh, harnessing digital technology to transfer um, to transform uh, understanding of Ogham writing, this an, uh, uh, and also the IRC AHRC network, um, a digital framework for the medieval Gaelic word, world. Uh, tonight, David is going to deliver his lecture titled "Old Irish Slang and Jargon: A Grammatical Approach." Thank you, uh, everybody, and thank you, uh, Fang Jie and uh, Lee. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear colleagues. It is a very great pleasure to have the honor of delivering uh, the Osborn Bergen Memorial Lecture 2022. And I want to extend my heartfelt thanks to Dr. Roisin McLaughlin and especially to Dr. Sanya Chiu uh, for that kind invitation. But before I begin, I also want to use the opportunity to congratulate Bang Jie uh, for the starting laureate award uh, that he received from the Irish Research Council last week. And I think that should around for the project. If, uh, for the sake of easy calculations, uh, we let the academic study of Old Irish begin with the publication of Johann Kasper Zeus's Grammatica Celtica in 1853, the language has been studied scientifically now for approximately 170 years. A constant theme running through characterizations of the language has been that Old Irish is largely uniform, that it is a kind of standard language. On a certain level of the discourse, in a certain understanding of the term uniform, I do not contest this. However, on a more fine-grained or microscopic level, as it were, it becomes quite quickly evident that Old Irish is not as monolithic as the term standard language suggests. When one looks closely, a lot of synchronic variation does become apparent. This is, of course, not a new insight. Tuanizes grammar makes frequent reference to variation between, for instance, the three main glossed manuscripts. What perhaps has been less realized is the extent to which a variation is found in the language. In my ESC-funded project, Chronological and Hibernicum, which came to a close last year and to which Fang Jie Chiu made so many crucial contributions, we identified more than 300 individual types of variation. The question then is, what is this variation? Is it simply the reflex of the normal progression of the language over time? That is to say, is it all just the development of Old Irish into Middle Irish? Or is there a regional element to it, i.e. are there dialectal variations? This question has been asked several times in the past and has usually been sweepingly rejected. I believe that the question has not been asked in the right way so far, or rather it has been approached with the wrong methodology. And this issue is something that I hope to be able to devote more attention to in, in a future research project. A question that has been asked even less frequently is whether that variation may neither be diachronic nor diatopic, but rather diastratic. Can we distinguish sociolects in Old Irish? And with, with this, I finally arrive at the topic of my talk today. 
The title of my talk mentions slang and jargon. These are, of course, two terms with a bad reputation. They are, as it were, the naughty siblings of dialect and register. As a linguist, I ought to refrain from making value judgments. But my choice of these loaded terms is on purpose. I think the examples that I will discuss today were intentionally created to mark the speakers as deviant and to characterize them either as less educated or unconventional outside of the norm. Social register in uh, Old Irish has not been studied extensively before. Even though Kim McCone introduced the concept of register in his 1985 article about Middle Irish in the Old Irish glosses, he was mainly thinking of a dichotomy of spoken versus written language. What I have in mind is rather different varieties within the spoken language. Investigating different varieties of spoken Old Irish may sound oxymoronic when, we all, when, when all we have are records of the written language. However, I think the situation is not as hopeless as it may look at first. Even though we do not have audio recordings of genuine Old Irish, and probably will never have unless physicists succeed in major technological breakthroughs, we do have a huge corpus of stylized spoken Old Irish and passages of direct speech, especially in sagas or other narrative texts. Purists may insist that it remains written language after all, and that, that it is therefore a pointless waste of time and effort. In a recent article, Jürgen Ulich quotes warnings that such passages may be or are artificial imitations of speech and literary colloquialisms. Yes, of course they are, but then from a pragmatic point of view, that's all we have. And as historical linguists, we are obliged and we are cursed to make the best of our always limited sources. A crucial tool in this respect is statistics. When a linguistic phenomenon occurs in a statistically significant frequency in one type of genre, but not in others, this tells us that something is going on and that we have to take that phenomenon seriously. What precisely it means is a question that we then have to answer qualitatively, but the quantitative approach as a first step provides us with a signal. The most explicit contribution to the question of social acts in Old Irish and an illustration of the principle has been Jürgen Ulich's 2018 demonstration that a number of deviations from the standard in the tale Finural Ronan, the kinslaying of Ronan, are clustered in such a way in a passage of direct speech by the nameless, but all the more inf infamous daughter of Ehith, that assuming chance or corruption during the manuscript transmission can be excluded. And we rather have to assume a deliberate stylistic decision by the author of the tale. Today, I will present case studies from two texts that I've been working on for many years, and in which I have, and actually independently of Ulrich's study, come to very similar conclusions. I hope that my new editions of these texts will appear in the not too distant future. I've prepared a handout with the texts plus translation, and I've marked in those uh, handouts in bold, those words and phrases that I make reference to during my talk. The first text is a poem of 16 stanzas preceded by a prose introduction formerly known as The Quarrel of Finn and Oshin. This text has been edited once under, the under that title by Kunomaya in 1910, but except for an article by Kevin Murray in 2017, the tale has since seen no treatment or reception worth mentioning, save for the briefest references in a handful of articles concerned with other matters. I talked about this text at a conference at the Royal Irish Academy in 2019, and have since prepared a new edition of this text, which has not appeared in print yet. My new edition will thus be the first full treatment in over a hundred years. In my new edition, I've given the tale the Old Irish title, Agaldaf Indagus Osheni. It starts with a brief prose introduction that sets the scene. Find is searching all over Ireland for his son Oshene, who has been missing for a year because of a grudge against his father. Finally, Find finds him in the, in the wilderness and prepares to attack him. But before they join weapons, they hold a conversation, or rather a boasting contest, in 16 alternating quatrains. In the end, they recognize each other and make peace, and that's it. You can see content-wise, it is maybe not the most exciting tale. To what extent the text is a variation on the literary motif of the tragic fight between a father and his son is a question that doesn't concern us today. Suffice it to note that most commentators have read it in this light. The reception of the tale Uh, he made several doubtful decisions in constituting the text, which add to the overall sense of confusion and obscurity. He was uncertain about the meanings of lines, which he left blank in his translations. 
and he did not take all available manuscript sources into account. Nevertheless, Maya was able to make enough sense of the text to call it a humorous and burlesque treatment of the fight, uh, sorry, of the theme of the fight between father and son. This key word burlesque has been repeated by most people who have commented on the tale since, with one exception, namely Donoha Kodoin, who in his Clavis Literarum Hibernensium characterized the text rather scathingly as an obscure prosimetrum on the on a conflict between Finn and his son Oshin. Maya believes that it is a burlesque treatment of the motive of Sokhrab and Rustam, but the humor is not apparent. Which one may respond that humor is often in the eye of the beholder? As I want to argue today, I actually do think that there is a sort of humor in the text, namely a humor inherent in how the language is used, a humor that has to do with tensions between different registers of speech. Dates in the 8th or 9th century have been suggested. The hesitancy about the date goes right to the heart of our matter today. Beside much which looks properly Old Irish, there's a number of forms and usages that point rather in the direction of Middle Irish. But as I will demonstrate, under closer inspection, those forms are not just randomly scattered across the text, but they follow a purposeful pattern. So let's have a closer look. The setting as such is promising. We have two warriors firing at each other in a war of words. The two combatants try to belittle each other, mostly along the lines that Finn, as the elder, denies young warriors' experience in endurance, while Oshene, the younger, accuses the old warrior of frailty and cowardice. So what about the language? First of all, there are minor deviations, which for philological reasons cannot be proven to have been part of the original text, but which may have crept in during the transmission by a Middle Irish note. I will not discuss them here. Hiatus can much more reliably be ascribed to the original composition because of the magical straitjacket of poetry. The status of hiatus turns out to be quite fluctuating in this text. But again, this needs not to be a sign of, of a particularly young age. As I've argued a few years ago in a study of the language of Plathbach's poems, already in the 8th century, and it doesn't really matter when exactly we want to date Plathbach's poems, already in the 8th century, hiatus had become some sort of optional for poets in Ireland, effectively a poetic license. In the following, however, I want to look at a few other issues more closely. I will study the text under the headings of expression of potentiality, expression of anteriority, gender fluidity, and finally, professional jargon. Let's start with uh, potentiality. In three stanzas, the speakers make utterances that involve verbs in the potential mood, i.e. where we use the auxiliary verb can in English. Oshene makes a start in stanza uh, four, where when he says about his opponent, the Shen Lai, the old warrior, he says, Nikon Kuvum Ar. He uses what is effectively an auxiliary verb, namely konig. If we translate this literally, it becomes something like, he cannot a slaughter i.e. he's not able to slaughter. This sounds awful in English, and I suspect it also sounded not sophisticated in Old Irish. To be clear, similar constructions are found in the Old Irish clauses, but they are not numerous. The remarkable thing is that Finn immediately in the next stanza answers this with a barrage of potential uh, verbs in a row. Ferelias, Burgoyne, Burgona, Rodafto, Bath. The gray-haired man, he can wound, he can be wounded, death can yield to him. We see here three potential augments abiding by the letter of Old Irish grammar, all augmented with a particle of wrong. As if Finn wants to make a grammatical point, as if he wants, as if he's saying, look, that's the way you do it. This is machine gun augmentation. Oshene takes up the challenge in stanza six and replies using a rock form, echoing precisely one of the verbs used by his father. O Rogonar, O Rogonar, caught for three, when he has been wounded thrice. But all that he manages to come up with is a verb with a resultative retrospective augment, not potential. In a way, he fails his grammatical test miserably, and it doesn't get better. Once more, in stanza 12, Oshene talks about possibility, and what does he produce? Ni fedad na shen hosa. The old feet cannot, i.e. the old feet are unable to function. This isn't even approximately Old Irish anymore, but full-blown Middle Irish, namely the innovatory simple verb fadith, that ultimately, through numerous transmogrifications, goes back to Old Irish Athkoda. Jürgen Ulrich has noted a similar use of Ni Edan in Finial Ronan, 
effectively a transitional stage to what we find in Agaldas Indagus Oceani. Now let's look at the morphosyntax of temporal clauses. Five times the opponents use the anterior temporal conjunction O when after. In the old Irish clauses, this is followed by independent main clause constructions. This is indeed what we find three times in our text, all in stanzas spoken by Oshena. In theory, Oshena's clauses could also be uniting, but this can't be seen in the orthography. Find uses the conjunction twice, but he always has a nasalizing relative clause after O. It would seem that he has read his grammar of old Irish, but that he misunderstood the tonizing and overapplied the rule that nasalizing relative clauses are used in temporal clauses. Find tries to sound posher than he is. <laughs> the third issue that I want to address in Akalda Findagus Oceane is that of gender. Gender was already a fluid concept before it became fashionable in, a, in very recent times. Although the gender of words referring to human beings is for the most part linked with the natural sex in Old Irish, this is not true for all nouns. There's a small group of generic nouns that refer to male persons, but which are grammatically feminine in Old Irish. Among them are Oglach, young warrior, and Ogwath, young warrior band, which behave like feminines in good old Irish texts. Since Adel of Indagus Oshene is concerned with two quarreling warriors, both words feature quite prominently in the text. The distribution of the forms is revealing. I will not go into the rather complex philological details of the partly divergent manuscript readings, but you, uh, I will just refer to my edited text, but you can see the variant readings on the screen. Let's look at the forms of Oglach first. The nominative singular is Oglach uh, twice, but since both occur without articles, it is impossible to decide if it is treated as feminine or masculine now. The matter is clear in the case of the nominative plural Ind Oglich and accusative plural Oglachu, both of which are unambiguously masculine. Those four forms are spoken by Oshena. His father Find, on the other hand, uses the original feminine Aspen accusative singular Ogli and genitive singular Oglige. The authorial uh, prose introduction has the A stem dative Ogli. Finn's only concession to the new way of talking is the O stem nominative plural Ogli. The same dichotomy is also found for Ogvas, young warrior band. In stanza six, Oshena uses the genitive singular Ind Ogvathe, which combines the masculine article Ind with a feminine R stem ending Ogvathe, secured by rhyme with Troche Doom. And in stanza 16, Ogvathu, he adds the masculine accusative plural ending to the noun. Find, in contrast, uses the original feminine R stem nominative singular in the Ogvath. It is worth noting that in the last case, the singular collective agrees with the verb in the plural. As for the extraordinary combination of the masculine article with the feminine genitive ending, the only parallel uh, uh, known to me of this rather rare behavior is the abstract carved craft that can refer concretely to the male craftsman. Edil contains three examples of the genitive singular in ferde or in kerde, uh, i.e. ostensibly the A stem inflection accompanied by the masculine article. None of the examples appears to be earlier than Middle Irish. To recapitulate briefly, we find in the verse dialogue between Find and his son Oshene a significant dichotomy between the old experience and ostensibly wise warrior, who for the most part uses the correct old forms, and the language of the young upstart, who in innovates in inflection and in gender by aligning the grammatical gender of words for warrior with the biological sex of the reference. Furthermore, we see variation in the expression of potentiality and in how temporal clauses are construed. The simpler, more analogical, or more analytic formations are typically used by the young warrior Oshene. Father and son are literally speaking different grammars of the same language. I want to stress at this point that all these remarkable deviations from standard old Irish practice are original to the text, either by agreement of the manuscripts or secured by metrics. Getting rid of them would only be possible at the expense of serious interference with the text. As for the literary aspects, the distribution of progressive, simpler, or analytic forms versus conservative, more complex, and synthetic forms seems to be a deliberate stylistic choice of the author, perhaps to correct, characterize the language of the young person as faulty, or faulty in inverted commas, or in any case as different in comparison to the better speech habit of the older person. The last issue that I want to address briefly is the question of the technical jargon that the warriors use. 
There is indeed a number of expressions in the dialogue that have stimulated previous attempts in translating and properly understanding what this is all about. Maya, for example, did not translate some of these lines because he couldn't make heads and tails of them. Unlike the grammatical feature that I just talked about, this jargon is not a mistake, uh, as such if viewed from the point of view of a standard language, but it is unusual to find it in writing. Like in any kind of idiomatic expression, the choice of words and phrases for a specific concept is not always obvious to the outsider, but the overall meaning usually illuminates from the context. Some terms may be specific to martial language, but others may belong more broadly to boasting style or even to the slang of youth gangs. I won't discuss everything, but I want to pick out a few particularly interesting examples. In Orgvath Berde in Nuro Agnelli seems to mean the young warrior band who bear the vanguard of the engagement, i.e. they fight in the front line of the battle. This was already recognized by Maya in a later addendum to his edition. In line 8c, line 8c is philologically difficult, and Maya had to refrain from even attempting uh, to print it in, 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 the, in the Irish text. But my tentative take on it is, is that it is Tarthage in Oglich Ele, uh, sorry, Tarthage in Oglich Ele, the young warriors in the engagement weld together. I think the verb is Tarthid, to weld, and the image is a fighter sticking inseparably together so that the lines can't be penetrated. There are several other expressions, such as atta i gungas, which perhaps means to be engaged in the attack, atta i vermen, to be in action, remmar, uh, forefield, shivkliya, long slaying, perhaps a term for combat over a distance, gartliya, rough striking, tolkthoi, flank attack. As I mentioned already, some of, it is, some of it is simply textually difficult. In stanza 11, ashlama, may mean barebacks as a pejorative term for people fleeing the battlefield. So, to return to the most burning question about this tale, is it funny? At the end of the prose introduction, immediately before the verse sets in, the narrator tells the reader, Kanich Oblerach Irof. They sing an Oblerach after that. Oblerach is a hapax that is evidently derived from Oblere, a word for juggler or rhymester the 10th or lowest grade of poets. A composition by somebody like this is hardly worthy of a king or hero. Accordingly, Idil defines Ovlerach as some kind of satirical composition, and Murphy translates it as lampoon. It is probably fair to say that the author of our text considered the dialogue in verse to be something entertaining. Entertainment doesn't have to be funny, but I nevertheless think that the authorial intention was to provoke laughter. The humor lies in the counter-expectational ingredients of the tale. Several of its constitutive elements go against what the contemporary audience would have expected of a Fenian tale. What is the scenario? Fynd and Oshin are the most iconic pair of inseparable father and son in Gaelic literature, but here we find father pitted against son without as much as a recognition between them. The second element is the plot. The two are in a duel, but in contrast to the shining champions they usually are, they do not carry out uh, that combat with their weapons, but they fling abuse and insult at each other like braggarts in a pub brawl. And thirdly, and most relevantly to my talk today, the register of the dialogue deviates from standard old Irish written usage. It incorporates pieces of the professional jargon of fighters that is otherwise absent from written lit literature, and it magnifies the differences in grammatical usage across the generations perhaps parodying the speech habits of certain types. None of these uh, narrative ingredients clashes uh, with expectations that we as a modern audience bring to an early Irish text, or what we can intuitively recognize as its, as its stylistically outstanding feature. Therefore, it can be said that Akhal of Indagus Oshini was funny once, a thousand years ago, but it is funny no more. The second text to which I will turn in some detail now, is one that I've been working on for almost 20 years, but which I'm now finally preparing for publication, namely the tragic tale Kovrak Lirdan Ekes Kodithir, the encounter of me or the meeting of Lirdan and Kodithir. It will form part of a book that includes two other editions of obscure old Irish poetry. Its envisaged uh, title is Trichel in Abilith, Tridlicheth in Dana. This approximately means through the intellectual skill of the poets, through the rules of the art two phrases that are found in those edited texts, 
and that encapsulate for me the very idea of coded poetical language in Old Irish. Like Akald of Indagas Oxini, Kobrak Lirnegas Kodathir has been edited once by Kuno Maya, 1902, but again, there is much to improve on his edition. Poems from the tale have been edited separately by numerous scholars, but none of them is relevant for my purposes today. The tale survives in two manuscripts from the 16th and 17th century, which I call H and T, and to which I will come back at various points. Time-wise, the tale is probably from roughly around the same time as Agald of Indus Orkney, or maybe a bit younger. Although the core of the tale is clearly Old Irish, there is, when scrutinized in the magnifying glass, a surprisingly large number of metrically secured forms that are progressive compared to the Old Irish glosses. They demonstrate that we should place the text sometime in the ninth century, perhaps rather late in that century. I just mentioned a few significant forms. Uh, so you can see them here. The rhyme Dera Chena, uh, instead of what should be in Old Irish Dero and Kenne, which would not rhyme. Uh, the very complicated case of the rhyme Bo Dartado, about which I will say nothing today. The verbal form Domenen, the relative particle Amia, or the inflected form Mi. I will also not say much about this psychologically complex and in many respects alien text. I just confine myself to the scene that is important for my present purposes. The Connacht poet Kudisir and the Munster poet as Lirden have fallen in love when they met in Connacht, but Lirden has postponed any consumption of the love to after her return to Munster. Kudisir honors the request, makes his way incognito to Munster and arrives at the less or the enclosure in which Lirden lives. The reader is conveniently not told at this point that the enclosure is in fact a nunnery and that Lirden has become a nun. The narrative is not really explicit about this, but Kudithir nevertheless seems to be aware of that fact because he does not simply enter the enclosure as you might expect. Instead, he dons his poet's cloak, puts the metal tips on his spears and shakes the spears. At this point, Magda Herda comes, the chief poet and chief fool of Ireland. Magda Herda, who may be a historical person of the first half of the seventh century, is known from several other tales that illustrate his inspired wit paired with foolishness, or what in times of political correctness we might rather call social awkwardness. As we shall see, the author of our tale also combines those two qualities in equal measure. So, in paragraph three, Magda Herda starts a dialogue with Purisir by saying, as a way of greeting, Mathchen, that's good. I assume this is a sign of his social awkwardness. To which Kurdithir replies, I mean, amen, as you would do. Let's first take a look at how the dialogue continues in Maya's uh, edition. A question follows that is not attributed to a specific speaker. In two fair English, are you the man of this court or of this enclosure? Nimi or Kurdithir? No, said Kurdithir. We may stop here and ask ourselves, why should Kurithir say this? It doesn't make sense from the logic of the tale. Kurithir is the one from abroad, while Magda Herde is the Mumonian, the local man from Munster. Both manuscripts read Kurithir, but I think this is a genuine typographic error, and Magda Herde has to be amended here. The question, are you the man of this court, still belongs to Kurithir, and not, as Meyer and most scholars since have thought, to Magda Herde. However, the more interesting point is another. The answer, ni me, not me, I'm not, is only found in manuscript T, but H has nak me. We may ask ourselves again, this time, what is that? It is in any case, the Lectio Difficilior. It consists of the independent negative nak or nak, no, not, which so serves as a uh, responsive to polar questions plus the independent first singular personal pronoun. I know of a single parallel for it in Milan uh, 72b4, for he was not powerful, not he. Edil actually quotes this under the headword naka, nothing, not, but it should really rather go under nak, nak. Extract, extrapolating from those two isolated examples, it appears to be used as if it contained the negative and the third singular copula. Its use in the mouth of Magda may be one of his rusticisms that characterize him as a fool. He seems to have generalized nak from a polar responsive to a general negative in responses. 
Perhaps this even indicates the currency of this construction in a certain register of everyday speech. Now, I skip three sentences. Curithia then asks, in rere ich in less, are you going, or rather, can you go into the enclosure? This is the regular Old Irish second singular future, form of tjech, to go, and note that Lear than two had used the first singular future, dorexa, I will come, in paragraph one. Paragraph one. But with Magdecherda's reply, Rachat, I will go, we are deep in Middle Irish territory. This first singular fo future form is Middle Irish both in stem and ending. And incidentally, this is almost still exactly the form used in Monster Irish. Corinthian knows that he himself does not have the possibility to enter the enclosure, of which, as I may remind you, the reader still does not know that it is a woman's cloister. But he rightly suspects that Magda Herder's position outside of no social boundaries will allow him to deliver a message. So he asks Magda Herder to tell Lirvan, through your own wit or intellectual skill, to come to meet him. And this phrase has obviously inspired the first part of the title of my forthcoming book. As a fool, Magda Herder transcends not only the conventional social rules, but also the limits of gender. And he can enter a zone that is exclusive to women without drawing attention to himself. He simply sits down in a room among a group with Lirvan and three other women, and everybody just ignores him. And with this, we come to Magda Herder's poem, the topic of, for the rest of my talk. I want to stress that everything I'm saying now refers specifically to the text as edited by myself, and which you have on the, on the handout. Other editors and translators have understood certain phrases differently. However, I'm the first to interpret the poem in a specifically variational linguistic light, and the overall coherence of my interpretation lends a degree of plausibility to it. At least I'm convinced of that. The poem consists of five stanzas, paragraphs five to nine in my edition. And when referring to the stanza of the poem, I will actually use the Roman numerals one to five uh, for the sake of convenience. Magda Herder's foolish, that is unconventional character, transpires even in the magical form. He does not observe poetic conventions. The poem is a mix of meters. The first stanza, paragraph five, can be described as Zion Arheng Gadic. What follows seems to be a form of Jevides Kalci Gadic, then two instances of Jevides Kalci, and the poem is closed by some loose sort of Ranier Tiaric or Zion Arheng Gadic. I did, in fact, not find exact formal parallels for the meters in Gerard Murphy's early Irish metrics. The Davide type quatrains have rin adrin rhyme. For those in the audience not so familiar with medieval Irish metrical terminology, this means that a word rhymes with a word that is one or two syllables longer. Ordinarily, this type of rhyme adheres to the order short word, short word in the first line of the couplet, the longer word in the second line. But in two instances, Magda puts the longer word first and then rhymes it with the shorter word. Finally, the poem is dunath or closure, which means that as a rule, the first word or first line reoccurs in some form in the last line or the last word. But in Magda Herder's poetical practice, the dunath is the first word of the second line and of the second last line. But all this is uh, only the formal side of the composition. Before I discuss the linguistic aspects, let me first read the poem to you in translation. O oh, big house, which the pillars support, if there should be someone here who would have made a tryst and order for them until sunsets. It would be time or well which is near their house that someone would come to it. Beautiful pointed larks perform the fluttering around it. Darkness has fallen upon my eyes. I'm incapable of discerning signs so that I call gray one every woman folk I do not recognize. Woman with a stout foot, I have not found your like of great fame. Never will be known under the veil woman folk that would be smarter. The son of the animal that stays at night on the pools while he's waiting for you, grayish feet support him with points. So this is a fairly accurate literal translation as far as the original permits. I assume that you all have a very clear idea now what is going on, <laughs> or don't you? Well, in which case you are in the same position as the three women in the room together with Leodon, who didn't understand the word. The message is meant to be decoded only by the professional poet Lirvan, and she actually gets it. 
It is a clever firework of word plays whose inventiveness highlights Magdalena's status as a top class poet. Just as his unconventional, non standard linguistic forms mark him out as a fool who does not have to be taken seriously, at, at least not by the uninitiated. I will go through the poem in detail to explain to you what, is, what it actually says. I also need to point out that there is a tricky textual problem in the second stanza, which I will ignore here. Suffice it to say that I think that the words or in the translation that someone would come to it may be a gloss or explanation that slipped into the text. My reading of the poem assumes that at the beginning of the delivery of the poem, Magda Herder does not speak directly to any person in the room, but rather to the house itself. This is the rhetoric device of apostrophe, the term for addressing an inanimate object, in this case the house, instead of human interlocutors. In the second stanza, he does the same with a well outside the house. With this ruse, Magda Herda creates the appearance of foolishness and can so deliver the message to the intended target, who is trained to recognize the code, even though three other pairs of ears are listening in. For everybody else, it's just a madman, babbling incoherently to the house in the well. The second couplet of stanza two begins, when we leave the problematic words untranslated, the Ushin perform the Luodan around it. So how many of you recognize the words Ushin and Luodan? You shouldn't be worried if you don't. Certainly one of them is made up by Magda Herda, or rather by the author of the tale. Uh, first, Ushin. Ushin is the reading of manuscript T, manuscript H as Ushi, without an N at the end. There is a word Ushin, meaning temples of the head, but it clearly cannot be this. Likewise, <clears throat> the adjective usha, just fitting right, and the abstract noun meekness, gentleness don't fit. The most likely solution is that the word is connected with ushog, modern Irish, fushog, uh, lark, even though the significance of the bird remains obscure. Ushog is a diminutive derived from a base ush, which is not attested. So probably ushi and ushin are biforms of this. Edil records also a variant Ushin uh, for the bird. Maybe the form in manuscript T is actually that, but it is unclear then why H is a form without the final N. Magda Herda makes ample use of double entendre. The larks are said to be uh, Ali, beautiful, and Imrindi. Imrindi, first of all, means having many points, sharp. This could be a reference to the spear points that Kurita brandished earlier in the episode. It is also a technical term in poetry, so perhaps a veiled allusion to the poet Kurithir waiting outside. And superficially and most harmlessly, Imrinde can refer to the pointed feathers on the heads of larks. It seems that Magda Herde is getting a triple sense uh, here with a single word. But what are those larks doing? They ferret luedem, they perform luedem. This is a hapax, again, a nonce formation. It is clearly intended as a variant uh, of lueth, the verbal noun of lueth here, to fly, extended with the productive verbal noun suffix ing, which is found in Middle Irish, tichtin, tichtin, coming from Old Irish, tichtu, or jekshin, gazing, inspecting from Old Irish, jekshu. So the larks are simply fluttering about. But why does the linguistic non-conformist Magda Herda use such a form in the first place? Well, that's a very easy solution to that. Luthen makes assonance with Lirden, the name of the intended recipient of the message. So its function is again to grab the attention of the one person in the room who is familiar with the, rhyme, with the rules of rhyming. Incidentally, the point of this coded message was totally lost on the scribe of manuscript H, who wrote Lirden straight away. The beginning of the third stanza ostensibly means darkness has come up upon my eyes, but there may be another layer of meaning intended for Lirden, who is trained in the poetic code. Perhaps uh, Rosk I serves as an innuendo to Roskov, poetical composition in difficult language. In this reading, the line carries a different message, namely, I have brought deliberate obscurity into my compositions. Since he operates on two levels of meaning, Magda Herda can keep up the pretense of darkness, and he complains that because of the darkness, every woman around him appears in gray without distinctive features. Gray is Lirth in Old Irish, 
When he calls every woman indiscriminately gray one, this becomes Lirthan, i.e. Lirthan, an effective Isidorian etymology. The verb that he uses for to call is congadio, whose primary meaning is to summon. By calling every woman gray one, he effectively summons Lirthan to the tryst with Curithir. In the fifth stanza, Magda Herda becomes as concrete as he can get. He describes Curithir as the son of the animal that stays under the water at night. This is straightforward. Uh, Curithir's father is called Dovarhu, Otter. He's, uh, 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 yeah, uh, Otter. So uh, he's said to have Kosagasa, gray feet. Otters have a brown coat and are cream colored on the underside, so the adjective glass could conceivably describe this color. But at the same time, it makes him a Dobarhu glass, a gray water dog, or rather a kuglas, a gray dog, a legal term for foreigners from overseas without legal status. Although not strictly from overseas, Kurdish's Connacht origin makes him a foreigner among the old monster men. The final expression for Rinjif is again polyvalent like Imrindje a few lines before. On the most ostensible level, rind, point or tip, refers to the sharp claws on the gray feet of the otter. But as a technical term for rhyme, final word of a verse line, it again evokes poetic craft in general and draws attention to the artfulness of Magda Scherder's own composition. Rindi also alludes again to, to the kenanangai, the tips of the spears that Kurithir brandished in front of the enclosure. And finally, forindif could be a socioelectoral pun on forendif, under the stars, i.e. out in the open, i.e. not here in the enclosure, if it were meant as a non-standard confusion of the two words rind, I stem masculine tip and point, or and rind, you stem neuter, significant heavenly body, by the low wretches of speaking fool Magda Herga. What we've seen in the preceding items is wit and verbal creativity associated with Magda Herda in the form of word workplays that require advanced knowledge of the technical or legal meanings of words. But now for the linguistic issues proprio sensu. I be begin again with the first stanza of the poem. Uh, the use of turada, properly the accusative plural in Old Irish, instead of the nominative plural turid, is a feature of the younger language. Since Magda Herda is addressing the house, but the message is intended for someone else, Dave in line four must be a third person sing, a third, third person, i.e., third plural. This allomorph, whose vocalism is, is secured by rhyme, does not occur in the Old Irish glosses where Doif and Doif dominate, but it is found in Middle Irish or Middle Irish influenced texts. The final word of the stanza, Fwinever, means literally sunsets i.e. a plurality of settings of the sun. This is a paradox. The setting of the sun is a single event, especially since Magda Herde is speaking of this one particular day. When referring to the sinking of the sun, the word only ever occurs in the singular funeth in medieval Irish sources. Its only other plural attestation is in the glosses in the Cambridge Juventus manuscript, where funith translates obitus or ocasus astrorum, the plurality of settings of stars. Furthermore, as Funit shows, the word is masculine, but Magda Herda has hypercorrectly hyper turned it into a neuter. The grammatical aberration in the wrong number and in the wrong gender may be yet another foolishism of Magda Herda. Obviously, Funit is needed for rhyme with Turida, but both rhyming words are wrong from the perspective of conventional language usage. I will race through the remaining noteworthy items. In Athenu, we have an analogical present stem replacing uh, Old Irish Athkninim. The noun clos, an alternative verbal noun of Roklinitha to here, is only attested twice in Irish literature. Its meaning here is evidently fame. Both manuscripts actually write it with an A, but the rhyme with Revelkosh requires O, which I've adopted for my edition. If, however, the A ah is original, one can speculate if the author was playing with a vulgar pronunciation, not only of Klosh as Klash, but only also of Kosh as Kash, prefiguring the dialectal divisions of, of the later Gaelic languages. And in God did not you, the preposition Og plus second singular possessive pronoun should be Ogot in standard Old Irish, but is here undergone aphoresis of the initial unstressed vowel, 
a regular feature of Middle Irish. Likewise, a simulated id not you for all the in not you is another progressive feature of Magdalena's register. So what can we take away from this close study of the literary figure Magdalena and his idiolect? Yeah, so is he a fool? <laughs> uh, the stratagem of the author plays out on several levels and plays uh, on the expectation of an implicit socioelectal imbalance. The tension between the rusticity of Magdalena's grammar and the ingenuity of his coded message is a deliberate stylistic choice. On the most accessible level, his, grammatical, his grammatically unconventional forms mark him out as a fool. Somebody who basically speaks Middle Irish, i.e. a low register, and whose form do not comply with the accepted norm of his social position, need not be taken seriously by normal old Irish people. Only the initiated who are prepared to scratch the uncouth surface will discover the brilliance of his utterances. The inventiveness of the dense sequence of word plays accentuates Magdalena's status as a high-ranking poet. He is Ardilina Herde, high poet of Ireland, at the same time despite and because of his non-conformist grammar. I don't want to end on a very theoretical note, but let me just wrap up my central points in a brief conclusion. In neither case had I picked the text initially to carry out research on socioelectal variation. In both cases, my original interest was entirely unrelated to the topic of today's talk. In a way, what I've presented to you with are serendipitous pickings from the wayside, not the harvest from a cultivated field. My approach has been similar to that of Jürgen Ulrich in his study of the register of Echid's daughter in Fingal Rona. A very close reading of the two texts informed by close attention to the manuscript evidence. I've only been able to make, a, to make brief reference in this talk to how essential it is that any such research, uh, that, that in any such research, the linguistic analysis goes hand in hand with a thorough philological assessment of the text. A text cannot simply be exploited for interesting forms with no relation to its intended meaning, audience, and interpretation. I think what these texts show us is that we have to exercise caution when dating texts linguistically. Linguistic variation in a text is not just accidental, subconscious slips of the author's tongue that can reveal us something about the chronological progression of language. Of course, it is that in many cases, but we tend to interpret innovations as fixed markers of a path through time when progressive, i.e. village language usage, may in fact be a deliberate stylistic device of an author to characterize the figures in his tale or composition socioelectally. When we make quantitative judgments about the age of a text on the basis of the amount of young features, intentional passages of the sort discussed today can skew the overall picture. They may have a con concrete narrative function, for example, in Jürgen Ulrich's study of Finnhal Ronin, the change of register occurs in very emotional speech, when the tone of the anti-heroine switches to open the aggressive. And finally, quite independently from concrete social acts and the chase for examples of slang and jargon, in our day and time of linguistic corpora, it would be immensely useful and interesting to not only have, a di have digital collections of medieval Irish texts in general, but specifically to have a diversified corpus of Old and Middle Irish dialogue. Yes, such passages may not be more than artificial imitations of speech, but only when we have such a collection will we be able to tell if and how dialogue as a genre is different from other textual types. Thank you very much, Dad. Wonderful lecture, which reminds us of some rare, you know, this rare angle of looking at the old Irish text, but based on very, very solid and close reading of the uh, of the text material and manuscript right? thank you uh, let's thank david again for tonight's lecture